All right. So I think we could probably get started here. Um, again, thank you all very much for, for joining us today and welcome to um, the Research and Dialogue Speaker Series. We're thrilled that you're able to join us for the second episode of our first season. Uh, my name is Amanda Everall. I'm a Knowledge Translation Coordinator for the Research Group here at the BC Centre on Substance Use. We would like to acknowledge that we're joining you today with gratitude from the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the traditional territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil nations. The reach of the work that we do here at the BC Centre on Substance Use touches the territories of all 198 First Nations in BC. I'd also like to take the time to recognize that the ongoing criminalization, institutionalization, and discrimination against people who use substances disproportionately harms Indigenous peoples. I'm uh, going to, <clears throat> excuse me, quickly go over the format for today's talk, after which I'll be passing the mic over to Dr. Thomas Kerr, who will be providing an introduction for today's speakers. Um, as you may have noticed, we are recording the session today, um, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, so we'll be posting this video online on the BCCSU website um, and also on the BCCSU YouTube channel. Um, as such, you're more than welcome to keep your camera off, um, but uh, if you want to turn it on, you're more than welcome to. It's as you wish. Um, we've also muted all attendees for this webinar. <clears throat> So we'll be starting out today with a presentation, following which we'll have time for a question and answer period. During the question and answer period, you can either type out your questions using the chat box function, or you can use the raise hand function in the reactions tab, um, at which time I'll be able to unmute you and you can ask your question. Um, I do also wanna really quickly mention that we've extended the webinar today to 1.30 p.m. Um, and this is just to provide a bit of extra time for a question and answer period, should we need it. If you need to step out before then, definitely feel free to do so, um, but we hope that you're able to join us for the full session. And with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Kerr to get our talk started. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be hosting this second edition of our uh, speaker series. We have a very uh, exciting talk today on some of the work that uh, Danya and others and Kali are doing with uh, with youth who use uh, drugs in Vancouver. Um, I'd just like to take a moment to introduce our speakers. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Danya Fass is an assistant professor in the Division of Social Medicine in the Department of Medicine at the University of British Columbia, as well as an associate member of UBC's Department of Anthropology. She's also a research scientist at the BC Center on Substance Use, where she leads the Youth Health Qualitative and Community-Based Research Program. Her work uh, focuses on tracing the substance use care and trajectories of young people who use drugs in Greater Vancouver across time and place as these individuals navigate multiple systems and services in overlapping public health crises. I'm also very uh, pleased to introduce Kali, who's a member of the Namgis First Nation and the sitting president of the Coalition of Peers Dismantling the Drug War in Vancouver. They are a stimulant user activist who advocates for and organizes around the provision of safe supply of drugs and access to safer consumption spaces for young people who use drugs. Kali is currently a peer supervisor at the Molson Overdose Prevention Site and the Mobile Overdose Prevention Unit in Vancouver. They're also a writer and a poet. And uh, Dania commented as we were uh, just gathering that, that Kali's always on the front line, and that's true of today, where they're uh, situated at an overdose prevention site. And so uh, uh, they may have to step away for a moment uh, if uh, called into duty. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll get through this with uh, no such incidents. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, pleased to see so many people here. Hope we have a good discussion after the presentations. Uh, we've left a lot of time for that, uh, given that we ran out uh, at our, our first go around. So, uh, you know, please be prepared to uh, join the dialogue once uh, the presenters are done. And with that, I'll, I'll turn things over to uh, Danielle and Polly. Okay, thank you so much, Thomas, and thank you, Amanda. 
Thank you for the introduction. I'm so honored to be here with Kali, someone who uh, inspires so much of the work that I do and such uh, an incredible collaborator of mine for so long. Can everyone see the slides and hear me? Yes, I'm seeing a nod from Amanda, so it looks like everything's working. Um, we're gonna start really just telling the story of how uh, Kali and I met and started working together before we get into what we really wanna focus on in today's session, which are our youth harm reduction calls to action. Oops. So, uh, and Kali, I'll get us started here, but feel free to, to jump in at any time if I miss anything. Kali and I met, we think, all the way back in 2015 through ARISE, the at-risk youth study, which is a large epidemiological cohort study that has been running for many, many years in Vancouver uh, that enrolls young people who use drugs, um, primarily in the context of unstable housing and homelessness and accessing so-called street youth services, um, but not exclusively. When we met, I had already been doing work with young people who use drugs in the Metro Vancouver area since 2007. Um, and Kali had just joined um, Arises, so that's short for the at-risk youth study, Arises Peer Research Associate Team. So just to, oops, no, I am. Just to give a quick overview before I let Kali jump in about the PRA or Peer Research Associate Program, uh, Arise is run out of a storefront, uh, frontline research space. And a lot of different things happen in that space, including the cohort study I just mentioned, my own qualitative and community-based work. Uh, we have a nurse who works there. So there's health consults and referrals happening. This is a hub where young people can access harm reduction supplies. And we've also done a number of arts-based projects out of the space. Oh, I'm having trouble. Sorry about that. Um, as I mentioned, there's a quantitative research program, that large cohort study that's run out of the space. And there's also a qualitative research program, which I lead, run out of the space. Now, let me turn it over to Kali to talk about the Peer Research Associate Program, which Kali joined shortly after its inception and is really um, how we met. Yeah, so the Peer Research um, Associate Program, which is a mouthful, but it's um so what we do is yeah recruit um mainly recruitment for the study so going out there and chatting with youth in different areas in Vancouver and Surrey and stuff like that to try and um introduce them to the study and just try and get them into the study for youth that are using drugs and we also do a bit of a yeah we also they also do a bit of outreach so just providing harm reduction supplies and stuff like that and just ways to engage with youth and to talk about safer drug use and stuff. But we also do a lot of advising on different papers um, with Arise, and that includes a variety of different papers, but also being um, authors on them, but also advising on them, and also same with knowledge translation with community engagements, but doing presentations in the community and stuff, and providing context around the different studies that we do provide, um, papers that we do provide, and making them more youth friendly. Thanks, Kali. Yeah, so Kali was working on this peer research associate or PRA program uh, at Arise out of this frontline research office where I was also doing a lot of work. And because I was there a lot doing qualitative interviews and, and arts-based programs with young people, I got to know all of the PRAs quite well, but especially Kali. And uh, in around 2016, 2017, I got some funding to really solidify my community based work with young people and to launch a community based participatory action research program. And that led to the creation of a YAC or the Youth Health Advisory Council, which has been active since 2018. 
And so, Kali, uh, you were still a PRA. You were still working on the quantitative side of things. Um, but you also joined the YAC and started to work on things with us. At this point, uh, the YAC, I think, was meeting monthly or twice a month. Now, as it happens, we meet weekly. But I think back then we were meeting once or twice a month. And the purpose of the YAC was really to inform uh, my, my program of research focused on young people's uh, substance use treatment trajectories. At that time, my research was very focused on, on substance use treatment engagement uh, and how young people were both engaging and disengaging with treatment across time. So Kali joined the YAC and we started meeting quite regularly and working together through the YAC. Kali, can you just talk about you know, how the YAC was different than, than your work with the PRA program, what some of the distinctions are between the two? Um, the distinctions between the two are um, the fact that PRAs do recruitment and um, bringing people into the study, but YAC is more just about collaborating around the different papers that are coming out, but also collaborating, are discussing about the different things that youth face in the real world of drug use and harm reduction and stuff. So just bringing it together those issues um, in a real context of actually being able to discuss it with different people instead of just like looking at papers and discussing them in that way with um, the team, it's more of youth coming together and discussing the real issues that you, um, youth face in the real world of drug use and harm reduction. Yeah, it became a real space of knowledge generation. I think more so than we maybe anticipated. I think initially we thought, well, maybe this will look kind of similar to the PRA program. But as we continued, I think what we realized with this that was that the YAC was a space and continues to be a space to share experiences, to generate new knowledge, as well as you know what Polly was talking about with um, consulting on papers. Uh, looking at you know papers that were under development and and really helping to improve those with the perspectives of lived and living experience. Kali, I know before you know we met before just before this at eleven a.m. to gather our thoughts, and I know um, you said a little bit about the challenges of authorship that you'd faced previously as a as a PRA back in two thousand fifteen, two thousand sixteen, two thousand seventeen. Can you talk a little bit about what some of the challenges were with you being involved as a co-author in yeah. the earliest papers where you were serving as a co-author? What were some of the challenges? And just to note, this was more on the quantitative side of things. Yeah, so one of the big challenges was um, I helped write and create a paper around inter intergenerational trauma for youth that used, I mean, for people that use drugs, but also just a face of like what resident schools did and stuff. But that paper, um, um, there's kind of a fight to become um, second author on it, and it's because I didn't have a degree or didn't have schooling, um, a PhD behind my name, but um, the person that um, wrote the paper with me kind of fought for that and made sure that it happened, and so it was a fight, but yeah, getting authorship as second author or anything like that, especially for papers that we've written or helped write, was really difficult because it was um, not having a PhD is a whole different thing, but um, it's true that people with experience can bring more knowledge to this stuff. And so having them as second author is really important and making sure that their voices are heard and stuff. So, yeah. Thanks, Kali. And the reason I wanted Kali to tell that story is because I think with the, with the YAC, with the Youth Health Advisory Council, we were able to build on the fights of so many before us at the BCCSU and elsewhere who had really fought for authorship um, shared authorship with people with lived and living experience, we were able, really able to build on that to involve a lot of young people as co-authors and also as lead authors as we moved forward. And it, it became much less of a fight. So I want to really acknowledge that work that came before, um, you know, by Thomas Kerr and Ryan McNeil and Brittany Barker and others who really, who really fought for that because that then allowed us Oops, that really allowed us to then involve Kali and a number of other young people on a range of publications as part of our work um, with the Youth Health Advisory Council. So here's one piece that we did um, that Kali was involved in, as well as Haley Anderson, another one of our YAC members, um, focused on opioid agonist therapy trajectories. Oops. 
And here is uh, another paper that we published much more recently, again, Kali is a co-author, that looks at our process, that really examines our, our process and uh, how messy it can become, but also how generative it is to do this community-based participatory action work. So Kali was involved as a co-author on that as well. Finally, most recently, we worked on a commentary together, uh, focused on, on questions of autonomy and incapacity. And you notice the in is in brackets, incapacity to consent in adolescent substance use treatment and care, and in particular hospitalization um, contexts. Really questioning um, some of the assumptions around adolescent incapacity to consent uh, in treatment setting. So Kali was also involved in that. I'm just going through these quickly just to give you a sense of the breadth of work that we've done together, but very happy to speak to any of these pieces in more detail during the question period. So now uh, coming to a very key event that uh, was led, you know, planned, led, and executed by Kali and a number of other young people. In 2019, we held a day for youth's voices on the overdose crisis. Um, it was a day long event. It brought together young people from across Metro Vancouver. It was entirely planned and led by the YAF with myself and a few other university researchers circulating the room as well as an elder. Um, there were a number of exceptional things, I think, about this event, but I'm going to let Kali speak about one really important part of the event, which was a youth-led overdose prevention site for youth by youth at this event in 2019. Yeah, the youth overdose prevention site was, I guess, one of the only ones before Viper came along, but it was also sanctioned by the um, Vancouver Coastal Health, so we were able to host it there. And um, so we managed to have a space there with along myself and the nurse were running that space and we had um, it was a space where people were able to just um, it became a chill space for everyone that just wanted a break from the event, but it was also a space where if someone wanted to use it, you were able to use it as a safe place, safe place to use instead of using having to use in a bathroom or going to hide outside. Like we also, yeah, um, went outside with people if they wanted to smoke, um, but it was, yeah, one of the um, very few first spaces where you can feel comfortable to go inside and use drugs comfortably without having to feel ashamed or having to go use and yeah in a bathroom or something where oftentimes um we don't find them until it's too late so yeah it was really this was really important and we managed to get it up and running which was really fun to do and yeah exciting for the fact that we got to run an OPS site there because it was really important too especially in the face of this um toxic drug poisonings or overdose crisis that was known before. So yeah, it was really exciting to help um, build it up and run it and be able to have that space where people can get clean supplies and use if they wanted to without judgment or fear of having to, without, yeah, fear of having to go somewhere else or having to hide in a bathroom to use. Yeah, thanks, Polly. So just to set the stage, uh, because this really ties to what we're going to, you know, discuss um, slightly later in this presentation, uh, our vision for a youth dedicated OPS, just to kind of set the stage, we were in UBC Robson Square. So, you know, it was somewhat institutional feeling environment, there were definitely limitations to the environment in terms of its youth friendliness. Um, and yet, we were able to create this room by stringing up twinkle lights and getting comfortable furniture, having a trusted nurse in the space, the same nurse, um, shout out to Michelle, who's been working at Arise for many years, uh, a trusted nurse that young people felt very comfortable with in the space, as well as Kali as a trained overdose responder. Um, that was an incredible partnership. So we had a youth uh, you know, a, a peer in the space, a young person, as well as a nurse, and, and managed to make this very comfortable space in this quite institutional environment. Um, and I think it was a tremendous success. Kali, I think you'll agree that one of the challenges of the space 
was that some people wanted to access it purely as a chill space, as a, as a space to take a break from the event. And we actually, you know, we had a situation that where there were some young parents with children at the event. And, you know, we had to really navigate that of, okay, who is using the space at what time, which really underscores that need for more than one space. And I was happy to see at the recent BCCSU conference, we, we had that division, which was great. Um, that's certainly an improvement we would make. Uh, but overall, I think we were able to create an incredibly comfortable, you know, youth centered space at this event. And as Kali said, it is one of the first sanctioned youth overdose prevention sites in the province to our knowledge. Uh, it was for one day, that's not nearly enough, but we wanted to highlight it as a real victory. Yeah, I think one of the challenges was just like, yeah, people that have kids was just coming into the space and there's some reduction spots around, they kind of got nervous around that or thinking that it was just a space where they can go and chill out, which was became an issue, but it was overall fine because we just put the spots away, but if people needed them, we were able to grab them for them. Yeah, we were, that's important to emphasize, we were able to keep, you know, kids completely safe and, and to really have things separated, having two different rooms would have been even better. I think what this also underscores is the urgent need, including in youth spaces for supports for parents who are who are using drugs or navigating, um, you know, navigating substance use. Um, so that was another important lesson was that when you have a youth led uh, youth engaged event, you are going to have young parents who, you know, potentially need to bring their children with them. And how do we create a safe space for everyone who's there? I'm not going to spend too much time on these images. Those who have seen talks by <laughs> Kali and I recently probably recognize them and might even be getting a bit sick of seeing them. Um, here are the images that came out of that Youth Voices event. Um, I, again, I, I, you know, I'm just flashing these up there to alert people to them in case you want to look at them in more detail. I also want to underscore that we published a peer-reviewed publication that summarized um, the findings that, you know, sort of the findings and discussion that emerged out of that event, as well as work that we did with young people across the province, including in Prince George and Kelowna. So I want to, again, I want to give a shout out to the young people who collaborated with us in Prince George and Kelowna. The work that we did on this project was not just limited to Metro Vancouver, it extended across the province, and that made the work so much stronger. Um, and we really hope to collaborate again with uh, the organizations and young people who we worked with in Prince George and Kelowna. We also published a report uh, out of the, the Youth Voices event co-authored by Kali and many other young people, including all of the members of our Youth Advisory Council, that really takes what we heard in focus groups, in interviews, and in that Youth Voices event and distills um, that into key recommendations and findings for care providers. So please, um, if you're interested in this report, ask us questions about it when we're done this presentation, or uh, please do access it on the BCCSU website. Okay, so that, you know, that brings us to what we're really here to talk about today, which are harm reduction calls to action. Um, Several years ago, I was invited by Harm Reduction Journal, along with uh, Alyssa Greer and, and others, to um, edit a special series on youth drugs and harm reduction. And we had a big advisory of, of young people who use drugs and organizations from all across the globe. And that advisory voted on different topics that they wanted to see addressed through commentaries. And this was one of the commentaries, this was one of the topics and the commentaries that emerged from that process. The focus, our focus was on young people experiencing uh, unstable housing and homelessness who use drugs. And we came together through the process uh, at Harm Reduction Journal with uh, young drug user activists from Lisbon, Portugal. So you see here, Joanna Canedo, uh, is the first author on this paper. She is an amazing drug user activist working in Lisbon. The Youth Advisory Council that is a part of my team 
Kali, uh, who by this point, by the time that we were working on this, had stepped away from, from the advisory council because of all of the other amazing activism and work that they were doing. Kali came together on this project, as well as uh, one young person, Kelly Ebert from Pittsburgh. And we worked together to develop uh, a series of harm reduction calls to action together. Uh, Kali, did you want to add anything about the process of, you know, connecting with Joanna and, and the Manus Collective, which is, is the organization that she leads in Lisbon? Yeah, so um, one important thing, or one big thing was that we saw that there was similarities in the fact of what you face when it comes to harm reduction in both Liz, like Portugal and Canada, or in, yeah, Canada, because it's how it is, it's just, um, for Canada, like we're really progressive, same as Lisbon and stuff, but it's like youth are still facing a lot of barriers when it comes to harm reduction. So like for instance, in Portugal, for instance, it's you have to, um, if you're you say use drugs and you get caught using drugs, you have to stand in front of a council, which is very different in Canada, where it's just you do you get denied services and stuff, which is happening in Lisbon too. Um, so it was really amazing to meet someone that is facing those issues, but also seeing a lot of the similarities that we face when it comes to harm reduction, especially for youth that use drugs. Yeah, so this wasn't necessarily planned because, you know, we had this process at Harm Reduction Journal where this big advisory and Joanna was a part of it and the Youth Health Advisory Council that's a part of my team was a part of it. You know, we had this big process and through, you know, where people voted on different topics and expressed interest in different topics through that process, we were brought together. But what we realized when we were brought together was, okay, we've got Lisbon and Vancouver, two settings of incredibly progressive drug policy. And yet, as we discussed things, we realized that may be so, but young people continue to be left out and left behind when it comes to harm reduction in both of these settings. And the focus primarily continues to be on abstinence, continues to be on treatment, and even involuntary treatment in both settings. There are mechanisms through which uh, young people are being forced into treatment. So- um, Or, make, or having to make that choice of either treatment or going to treatment or choosing um, jail, which hopefully should not be an option, but it's a big thing where it's like you have that option, like mandatory treatment or jail, a lot of times when it comes when the cop is drugs. Yeah, thanks, Kali. Yeah, so- um, these discussions were incredibly rich and uh, incredibly fruitful because there was so much overlap in terms of what these young drug user activists in, in Lisbon and who are part of this Manus Collective, which is a self-identified women-led group um, of people who use drugs and also you know, what was happening for members of the Youth Health Advisory Council and for Kali and all of those Kali is networked with um, here in Vancouver. So we developed these harm reduction calls to action. Before we show, before we put up those actual calls, I just wanna step back for a moment. I mentioned the Manus Collective that Joanna Canedo leads in, in Lisbon, which obviously informed you know, where she was coming from with these harm reduction calls to action. I wanna give Kali a chance now to talk about their work with the Coalition of Peers Dismantling the Drug War. Because by, as I said, by the time that we were working on this, these harm reduction calls to action together, Kali was no longer uh, an active member of the YAC, let's say, of the Youth Health Advisory Council. So Kali will always be an honorary member of the YAC, um, and we loop Kali in whenever needed. But Kali was no longer attending those weekly meetings because of all of this incredible activism um, and other work that you know Kali was doing by this time. Yeah, so I run um, Coalition of Peers Dismantling Drug War, or CPW for short. We're, um, it's a drug user led and collective group of drug users, of all people who use drugs and it's, um, We've been trying to get a youth thing started, but like I work with youth exclusively that use drugs and especially allowing them to use drugs, like have, um, allowing them to use drugs and wherever they are. So doing EOPS with them because there's some space for them to go. Um, with the Coalition of Peers, though, with a lot of the youth that I work with, we managed to write up um, a document that's been worked on for the last two years and really important document of mine, or really odd thing of mine because we, the youth that I work with and just the story that they told was 
they're all shared things collectively. It was never just an individual story. It was always collectively shared. So things that they face is like not having access to an OPS, not having a rush supplies access. Cause like we, um, in this toxic drug poisonings, we're losing youth also. And a lot of people don't want to recognize that, but it's always an afterthought when it comes to talking about harm reduction or anything like that. It's always never thought about it. It's always about treatment and, and voluntary treatment and stuff like that. So coalition of here really advocates and really fights for um, having youth voices out there, but also fighting for a space for youth to use safely and stuff. And through this document, we managed to come up, um, youth came up with ideas for youth OPS of what it would look like, and then also for home Russian draft policy and another, and just like important things that youth came together collectively around just the fact that youth are being left out of the conversations and the most important needs for youth when it comes to youth and drugs, because it's often never talked about and often forgotten about. So it was important work for myself and it's work that I'll continue doing, but it's, um, we keep denying, like a lot of times we keep denying the fact that youth use drugs and we keep wanting to save them or protect them when that's not always the case. And especially for youth that are um, indigenous, LGBTQ2, T, T, T plus, um, are really facing a lot more barriers, especially street involved youth. Um, face a lot Because they don't have like a lot of the calls for absent or involuntary treatment is based around parents that have lost children to overdose and stuff, but it's never looked at for youth that are street involved um, indigenous or anything that faced a lot more barriers and would be used as repercussion on them. So when we fought against Bill 22 a few years ago, um, that was for um, to bring in and multi treatment for youth and manage to stop it through activism through this, but also from the collective uh, stories of youth that we're dealing with and so that they wouldn't out like they wouldn't trust anyone if they did do it because it would create a big barrier with healthcare and also with calling 911 for overdoses and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Kali. Um, I, you know, I think it's clear, but just to make it even clearer, um, harm reduction is something that all young people should have access to. Uh, however, Kali and I, uh, you know, in the Youth Health Advisory Council, we are particularly fighting for, you know, for harm reduction and, and trying to amplify the voices of young people experiencing unstable housing and homelessness, for queer and trans young people, Indigenous young people, and young people with experience in government care. That's the population that we primarily work with, uh, young people who are at various intersections of those, of those different experiences, and so we're really fighting um, to meet their needs, although we absolutely want every young person to have access to harm reduction. So here are our harm reduction calls to action. Uh, hopefully some people have seen these before. This is a two pager. Um, I'll just show there's the second page. Here's the first page. Here's the second page. Um, this is a two pager handout that we've been distributing all over town. You might have seen it up in certain low barrier, low threshold youth services. I understand that it is being put up in settings across Canada um, because many people who, who come across this document say, hey, this really reflects my values or this really reflects the values of the young people who we work in at our shelter, at our drop-in service, at our housing program. So it's really exciting for us that so many people across the province across the country have connected with this document and um, why don't we just go ahead and, and read out the calls Kali should um, should I start us off sure <laughs> okay so number one we oppose approaches to preventing drug related harms that are premised on abstinence um, young people's engagement with harm reduction programs and sites should be kept confidential we demand investment in low barrier and youth led harm reduction programs and spaces, including safer consumption sites or overdose prevention sites. Youth oriented programs and spaces must account for the needs of polysubstance use using youth, um, BIPOC youth, gender diverse and queer youth, and self identified young women. Stop pathologizing young people who use drugs and trying to save or fix them. The services and systems that young people who use drugs. Um, Traverse must be redesigned for fosters um, to foster youth self-determination in relation to their drug use, harm reduction, care, and families. 
We add our voices to those demanding the decriminalization of drug use and an end to the war on drugs. We add our voices to those demanding a safe supply for drugs via peer-led um, compassion clubs. Youth voices should be better integrated into both bottom-up, grassroots, and top-down state-sponsored harm reduction movements. And young people use drugs in the context of greater privilege and allies should focus energy on fostering and extending the activism of young people use drugs in the context of street involvement. Yeah, thanks. And obviously that last one is where I come in uh, as an ally, really just working to support the work of people like Holly, Joanna, all of the members of our Youth Health Advisory Council and many others in fighting for the things they need to keep themselves safe and alive. So we're not going to go over this because I want to make sure there's plenty of time for, for questions, but there is a second side to this. If you have trouble accessing this document, please email me. Um, we are so happy to distribute this far and wide. And um, there's just a lot more detail here about the different calls. Um, but all of the detail here are, I think, things that Kali has already mentioned, such as, you know, the need for voluntary approaches, for example, uh, not involuntary. Yeah, and just access to basic harm reduction supplies too, because it's like when you don't have access to that, it's very troublesome because a lot of times if you're um, picking up like a rig off the street or digging a rig boxes and it becomes very a bigger issue because it's just at risk for disease and overdose, which is what we're trying to prevent in harm reduction. Yeah, thanks, Kali. Uh, I had to include this, this photograph. Uh, so here is Kali, of course, and Joanna Canedo presenting our harm reduction calls to action at the Lisbon Addictions 2022 conference. Kali uh, got a full scholarship to attend the conference, and um, that allowed us to connect in person with Joanna and other members of the Manus Collective, which was an incredible experience. We got to see their drop-in space. We got to see what they're doing, their activism, what they're fighting for. Um, we even got to participate in a protest. And um, Kali and Joanna just did such an incredible job of presenting this. And there was so much interest in the calls to action at the conference, which was really exciting to see. This is our final slide, because again, we really want to get into conversation with the audience about all of this. We want to hear from you about youth harm reduction and what you think the calls to action should be or any concerns um, about, you know, implementing these calls in the real world. But we have to end with this, which is, you know, I think is what we're fighting for. It's certainly what Kali is and has been fighting for for a long time which is a youth dedicated and led overdose prevention site. Kali, uh, I'll just hand it over to you to talk about this vision, but shout out to Sophie McKenzie for this incredible image. Yes, yeah, big thanks to her because it's really brought the dream forward because we've <laughs> attempted to um, try to get one open, but we discovered the infant fact is still alive and um, an issue. But for youth led OPS, it would need to be a space where youth are able to connect, just like kind of like, I don't know if many people know what direction to services is, but it's similar to that, but just a bit more different for the fact that they have um, an injection site and um, an inhalation room as long, along with um, space where people are able to connect with eating food together. Um, a lot of times when it comes to making meals and stuff, youth will be able to connect to that and a space where you're able to just chill out and watch TV or play game, video games and then also a smoking area and just a space where you are able to feel comfortable and connect because that's what harm reduction is mainly about is about building connections because you're able to, and just a space where they're able to talk openly about drug use but also use safely and be able to ask questions about their like injection use or if they're injecting on safe or anything like that because a lot of times when youth are accessing adult sites they feel like they need to um, they can't ask those questions because they feel like they need to be, they need to know what they're doing or they need to feel like they really understand or they already know what they're doing when that's not always the case when they should be able to ask questions openly and without judgment or without having to feel like if the adults know what they're doing, I should know what I'm doing. And so a space like this would be able to um, bring you together, but also have space where you are able to use and then just chill out if they wanted to or eat food or whatever. And just be able to just connect with other people, especially workers that understand and um, understand and get what they're going through, because a lot of times in adult spaces it can be difficult 
for them to and just have an open discussions around drug use because it's not often talked about, but also just a space where they need just to chill out and just not having a good time. They're able to come into the space and just feel comfortable and feel like they can just chill out and relax from what's going on outside in the world because it's oftentimes crises do happen and they don't have spaces where they can go and just take five minutes or something, just take a breather from the streets and just relax. And so the space like this would probably end up looking like and so making these comfortable and making sure that they're um safe in somewhere or safe for say in, in some space where they can feel comfortable asking anything and knowing that they won't feel judgment or feel like they need to know what they're doing yeah thanks so much Kali. i mean one thing i want to add is you know there's been a tremendous focus on treatment uh when it comes to young people who use drugs and we've already talked about the limitations of you know, treatment approaches that focus on abstinence, but even, even treatment approaches that don't focus on abstinence. And I know there's, you know, there's many practitioners in Vancouver, across the province and across the country who are not pushing young people towards abstinence necessarily. But even then, uh, what we've heard over and over from young people is they need, you know, they need a refuge from sites that are very medicalized, from sites that are very institutional, from sites where the focus is on treatment, whether that's mental health treatment or substance use treatment. They need a place that's a bit of a break from that, even if treatment is something that they're considering. So that's why it's so important that there is a harm reduction only kind of space, a space that's, that's a community space that isn't focused on, on medical models, that's focused on harm reduction. Yes, in terms of cleaner, you know. Yes, in terms of in terms of like um, sterile supplies and naloxone kits. Yes, there's that, and and there's the education around injecting and smoking, and there's the supervised use, but also harm reduction in terms of connection, like Holly was saying, shared causes, shared meals, art, music, having a smoke together. It can be small, it can be big, but having that space that's about connection and about harm reduction that is separate from spaces that are more focused on treatment and helping and what we sometimes hear from young people, fixing, fixing us, um, trying to fix us. So um, that's why, you know, we want to be careful about how, you know, designing, let's say, a space like this and then having a little clinic in the space? Is that something we want to do? Or do we want to be able to just, for example, walk somebody to another building if they want to access a clinic or if they want to access medical care? These are things that, that we really want to think about if and when we are making this a reality. Kali, do you have anything to add on that point? Yes. Um, another big thing is just, um, like, yeah, wound care is something that we're dealing a lot with youth right now. And it's something that a lot of times they have a lot of fear. So their wounds end up getting worse. And so having a place where they're able to go get wound care without judgment or like going to the hospital and getting, going to them, like for instance, St. Paul's or BGH and then having to get sent to a children's hospital, which is another long trek and also really far from the downtown core. So youth often don't get their wounds checked on or get their support for their wounds. So they end up getting worse or they end up getting, having to be hospitalized for the fact that their wound has grown so having space where they're able to get that done is really important too also um youth are very yeah like a lot of times when it comes to youth it's always about saving them or fixing them and that's not always should be shouldn't be the case because it should be about like no one ever thinks about harm reduction for youth because it's such an afterthought they think that it's always about protecting and saving them and that's not shouldn't be the case it should be about seeing what their needs are asking them what their needs are and creating options for them not just forcing something down their throat that they don't maybe need because that actually creates a lot more damage than it does because like the use that I've worked with it's always about connecting it's always about asking them what they need but they want what they need at the moment and just and even just even if that's just a smoke or something like that then that's what it is but it's um use are really hard to it's hard to build trust with them sometimes so it's really important to give them opportunities but also just giving them that space to build those relationships with you too Let's leave it there. That's the perfect ending. Um, why don't we uh, go to questions now and discussion? Perfect. Yes. Thank you both so very much for, for shining a light on this important area and 
and helping us better understand the experiences and and the possible solutions to some of these these challenges that youth are facing. Um, we're ready to open up for question and answer. Uh, if anybody wants to submit a question, feel free to, um, as I mentioned earlier, use the reactions tab at the bottom to raise your hand or to enter your question in the chat box. Um, we do have one question that was submitted a little earlier um, to get us started. So the first one here is, what happened to Bill 22 back in 2020? Is it completely scrapped or is there a new iteration of it? So Bill 22 is completely scrapped, but it's now coming under the iteration of um, for everyone. So now it's just being reused in a different way by having involuntary care that they're trying to put for, or not going to call it involuntary care, actually, it's just stigmatizing apparently. But they're going to, um, it's being reused as, but with the context of everyone included in it, so like using it in voluntary treatment for everybody and anybody. The bill was, I'm glad it was scrapped because it took a lot of fighting to do that. And so, yeah, it's completely, yeah, stopped, so. I think Holly and I, and, and I know there are others here who are working on this issue of involuntary care are, are frustrated by, you know, we've, I think Holly and I have both spent endless hours in meetings about this issue. We thought that we had come to a place with government where, you know, the decision was, we're not going to do this. This would be harmful. This would be particularly harmful for Indigenous young people. You know, we, we thought we kind of got there. We even received an official letter to that effect. And then, um, you know, it keeps coming up again and again, sort of keeps coming back in different versions of this proposal for involuntary treatment and care for people who use drugs. Um, and we just really want to emphasize that one of our key harm reduction calls to action is that um, treatment and care should be voluntary. It should be about building relationships. Of course, there are instances where involuntary treatment and care is necessary, but we've seen a slippery slope at times where young people are being deemed incapable of consenting to care or having an active role in their care simply because they are young people who use drugs. And we, we find that deeply concerning. So these conversations well, are obviously going to continue. <laughs> um, and the big thing about um... I feel like it was retaliation, but we lost a really important service um, when the bill was scrapped, a year, like um, a few months later, which was you, the um, Direction Youth Detox, which was a really important service for youth that were using drugs, but also for street involved youth. Like I'm, I went to it and so did a lot of people that I know. And losing that was really impactful because it was um, the fact that now youth don't have anywhere to go to detox. Um, there's one in Surrey, but it's not very friendly. It's still mixed with adults and mixing youth with adults and detoxing is never a good idea. And the big thing about that too is they went to home detoxing, which a lot of youth that don't have home can't detox. So it was frustrating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I've got a, a bunch more questions coming through on the chat. Um, this one here is two parts. The first part is what are the key barriers and challenges for youth OPS, both legally and regulatory? Maybe we'll start with that and I'll do the second portion afterwards. The legal issues is the um, what's called the Infants Act, which is based around the um, care around youth and stuff, and it's a big barrier because it's um, they label in there with mature minors when youth can consent to healthcare or anything related to healthcare or substance use, and so that's the one legal issue that we've been facing. Because if um, what they will label it as is child endangerment, which is not what we're doing, but under the law it is so. That was um, the legal issue that we've been facing around trying to open up the youth OPS. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything to add there, Dania? Are you good? No, I think Kali is really the expert yeah. on, on that one. I mean, I, I, I guess maybe I'll just say again, I think, I think we're, whether intentional or not, we're still focusing on treatment and recovery as routes to abstinence. That's really where the conversation is with young people who use drugs and especially those under 18. Um, and Kali and I are really working to shift that and are really arguing that a harm reduction space that's accessible to even very young youth can really be life-saving. Um, 
not just because you go there to you know use use drugs and that's witnessed and there's someone there to respond if you overdose but also because of the relationships and connections that are formed there and this is nothing new we've been hearing about this you know that that harm reduction and connecting through harm reduction can can save lives from from organizations like vandu for decades and yet when it comes to young people there's much less openness to that to that suggestion to that idea yeah yeah absolutely um, the second part of this question was specifically for you, Dania, but possibly Kelly can, can reply as well. Um, could you elaborate on the challenges to publication with peers and if it came at all from academic journals? Well, I think, you know, like I said, Kali and I connected this morning just to go over this presentation and, and Kali was talking about how it was challenging when working on a paper, you know, early on in their work with the BCCSU and with, with academics that there was some pushback about being a second author, but we haven't received any pushback now on the many papers that we've published together. So again, that's why I was saying, I, I really feel like we're building on the work of others to be able to do this with, with very little, um, little pushback. In fact, encouragement. Um, now, of course, I, I, I'm a series editor at Harm Reduction Journal where two of the articles that I showed have been published. They were peer reviewed, uh, everything was above, above board. I didn't just get to push them through, but um, obviously that helps as well. And, and actually um, for the, you know, maybe I can make this announcement here. There's actually now going to be a permanent youth drugs and harm reduction section at harm reduction journal that I and a number of others will be editing. And what we're really hoping to do with that section is to really push for change when it comes to authorship and the kinds of work that can be published and the kinds of formats so that there are many more opportunities for young people who use drugs to publish in academic journals, not just as co-authors, but as first authors, as lead authors. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an important area, but I have to say that I think things are changing in really positive ways, at least from what I've seen. And we, we published in quite a range of journals. So um, I think things are changing for the better in that area. Good. Yeah, that's that's good to hear. This um, next question actually is on the same subject, so I'll, I'll bring it up now. Um, what were the processes behind the fight in supporting co-authorship? And I know you've kind of touched on some of this already. I wasn't involved in that because that was on the quantitative side of things. Kali, are you able to share, recognizing that, you know, some of those details might be private, are you able to share anything about that fight um, for co-authorship? Um, kind of. It was more just about the fact that I didn't have a PhD. <laughs> That's all it was, like, there's more information, but it's just, yeah, a lot of it you can't share, but yeah, it was mainly just about them not seeing that I didn't have any credits behind my name, which was kind of funny, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's as simple as journals have text boxes that need to be filled in. So I would imagine what might have happened is, oh, well, what letters go after Kali Sedgemore's name? And it's like, well, there's none. And it's like, well, that can't be. And that doesn't work with our, you know, our computer program. <laughs> so it, you know, it's these relatively, um, you know, simple glitches that can can cause a journal to come back and say, I don't understand this. And we often got that as well when we would add the Youth Health Advisory Council as a co-author, as a single co-author, it wouldn't fit in the journal's formatting and they would have a lot of trouble with, you know, getting it uh, sort of typed out correctly in the final manuscript proof. So some of these are small things that we just need to work with journals on. And sometimes it's a much deeper issue, you know, where someone's actually questioning someone's expertise because they don't have a PhD or, you know, an MD or an MA or whatever it is. But I think certainly in Vancouver, it's quite widely accepted that lived experience and expertise is as valid as any academic credentials and people should absolutely be honored for their time and expertise with co-authorship. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. That, um, makes complete sense to me, definitely. Um, this next question is about the at-risk youth study cohort. Um, they said it might be, is there any specific data generated to understand what recovery goals look like for youth who may have treatment or recovery goals in mind? 
For example, are there specific questions asked to youth about recovery goals in the ARISE questionnaire or interviews? So we're, you know, I'm representing the qualitative and, you know, qualitative and community-based um, side of, of the program. Um, I think that question is probably better directed to, to those who lead the quantitative side of things. Um, I will say that we're talking about harm reduction here today, but I want to emphasize that we're always completely open to talking with youth about treatment and recovery. And many youth do talk about treatment and recovery and youth do talk about abstinence. And that's absolutely something, you know, I have, I, I the last, um, you know, five to seven years, a lot of my grants have focused on treatment engagement and I just got uh, a new grant about recovery futurism. So this is not something that we're not focusing on. It's not an either or situation. It's not that, okay, we're so focused on harm reduction that we're not willing to talk with young people about their desires for treatment and for recovery. We absolutely talk to young people about those things, including on our Youth Health Advisory Council all the time. Um, it's just that we're here today talking about harm reduction, but we absolutely believe that at a, at a youth OPS, young people should be able to open up conversations about treatment, about recovery, about abstinence, and get connections to what they want from, from that site. Absolutely. Yeah, like, especially with the work that I do with youth, it's like we do talk about, like, some do talk about treatment and talk about recovery and stuff like that, but it's, um, it's a challenge because there is fairly like there is there are services, but it's hard to get them new services. It's long wait lists and stuff like that. So a lot of youth have a hard time like waiting for those long wait lists. Like sometimes it can be a month to two weeks to get into TV talks, or it can be um those long wait lists. And that's deter you from accident from what we talk about it a lot, like a lot of youth that I work with, we talk about it a lot. And it's something else. Some youth are want to focus on, some youth just want to know more information about it, and other youth don't think absence base would be appropriate for them because they feel like they're because a lot of these youth that I we I mean I've been working with are second are the first generation of kids that have lost parents to overdose so it's really they're dealing with a lot of trauma from dealing with that so it's yeah like a lot of times they don't see they see recovery but they also see it as a, um an option that's not in their mind at the moment but some of them do see it in their mind but and others just want harm reduction supplies and just want harm reduction basics education which is also an option because you can do harm reduction and treatment, which is like recovery to them in a sense. Yeah, um, thanks, Kali. Like one thing we really want to do with this new recovery futurisms grant or you know reimagining recovery grant is is to talk to young people um, about all of the different ways that recovery we may you know we may drop that word because uh, I know it's a it's a loaded word but all of the different ways that recovery or healing or wellness or however we want to, to talk about it, like all of the different ways that that can look. And absolutely for some young people, harm reduction is a huge part of recovery um, and with how they identify as being in recovery. So we wanna, we wanna make space for all of it. Um, and we're certainly not discounting any of it, if that, may, if that makes sense. We just want to make sure that young people aren't exclusively, um, you know, met with abstinence-based approaches, with you know, treatment and recovery, and 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 that's it. Um, we want to make sure that harm reduction is there as well and is a, a real cornerstone of what's being offered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's not; they're not mutually exclusive. There's like. A, a continuum of care and, and many options um, that can work together for depending on what people need. Um, what, the next question I have for you is what ages constitute youth, if I may ask? Yeah, great question. Um, that's and a complicated question. So uh, our studies have different age ranges. Um, I would say the most, you know, sort of typical age range of, of the qualitative studies is 14 to 24, 25, 26 at the time of enrollment. Okay, so because my work is longitudinal, it means you, you could join the study when you're 26 and it could still be going on in five years. So you're, you're in the study um, now perhaps as a, as a young adult as opposed to a youth. 
Um, but one thing that we really wrote about in our harm reduction calls to action paper that I flashed up um, is that there's a, the, there's a feeling among a lot of young people globally that, um, you know, the sort of youth category, or at least when, when it comes to youth drug user activism, that that category should extend really all the way up to 29. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the young people we worked with on those harm reduction calls to action were over 25, 26 even, and said, hey, I don't want to be excluded from this. I'm a passionate youth drug user activist, and this is where my fight is, and I don't identify with with political actions happening among older folks who use drugs. Really curious to hear from you, Kali, on, on how you position yourself. I'm not a, I'm technically not a youth anymore, but I still get um I still fit that category technically. But yeah, it's a it's a challenging one. So I would I would say that it's um for any youth that we work with, it goes from age 12 to um 29. And it's um, but I'm a lot of people still consider me a youth, even though I'm in my 30s, but so I would say it should go up to 35. <laughs> Certainly in terms of being drawn into the activism and the, and the, and the movements that are developing in Vancouver, we, we wouldn't want to be excluding, you know, Kali or other members of our Youth Advisory Council who are now going into their, their early 30s. Now, I want to just say, because, you know, we get asked this question all the time, that doesn't mean that we lump together when we're doing the research that we lump together the experiences of a 14 year old and a 29 year old. We absolutely look at, in the research at distinct age ranges as well as across them. So we will absolutely look at that 12 to, you know, 18 category or 14 to 18 year old category. Um, and then we'll look at sort of 19 to 24, 25, which for those who have navigated the youth system or who work within it, we know that that's another period where you're able to access very distinct supports. And then of course at 25, 26, up until 29, that's when unfortunately a lot of services and supports that are focused on young people drop away. Uh, and that can be very difficult for those in that age range who do not feel connected, for example, to more of the adult oriented services in the downtown east side and really want to remain more connected to services for younger people and yet they've now aged out. So we absolutely look um, within different age ranges as we're doing, doing the research. We don't yeah. just together. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. The concept of aging out and, and having your services taken away from you. Well, I've mentioned before um, is that you when you're you when you're a youth in care like I'm a, a youth from care is that you age out technically three times so you age out when you're you age out when you're um, 19 and you age out when you're 21 which you lose all your mental health um, services you lose um, any health benefit like mental health or benefits that you had you lose that at 21 and then 26 is when you lose the youth oriented services like directions and stuff like that but a lot of times they help you with age out plans and stuff but it's like yeah when you're a youth in care you age out three times. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so that's why it's so important to look also, you know, in, in terms of my research and the research that, you know, Kali and I are collaborating on, we also really want to look across. We want to look at those transitions and what happens as, as young people move across these different age ranges, because that tells us some really important things about how risk and harm are generated as young people are being asked to navigate different configurations of services and systems. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Um, before I move on to the next question, I've had a few comments and questions about getting copies of the report on resistance and some of the other materials. So I just want to let everyone know um, we will be posting supporting materials as well as this video um, on the BCCSU website, and I'll be sending out an email to all attendees um, with links to that um, after our session today. Yes, please access the materials and, and, and share them far and wide, please. Um, email me personally if you have any trouble accessing anything. We're so keen for this work to be out there and also for it to be a starting point for conversation. So if you read the harm reduction calls to actions two pager and you think, hey, something's really missing from this or this really doesn't fit with what's happening for me or for my service setting, um, we would also love to hear from you um, because it's meant to be the start of a conversation um, and a way to connect politically, but certainly not the final word. 
Absolutely. Um, the next question, can you speak to the larger systemic issues or policies that challenge the ability to open a youth SCS? People are just scared to because it's like it's youth that are using drugs and it's like they don't want to focus on um, safety when it comes to youth using drugs. They want to focus on getting them a course in treatment or getting them absent based stuff. And it's really challenging because it's also people are scared for youth opioids because they're scared that it will enable um, youth to use drugs, but that's never the case. Like everyone knows what the spaces are for and stuff. And it's just um, like I, I do a lot of EOPS, which is doing it on demand and that's um, a challenge in itself, but it's also just people are so scared to have a space where you are able to use drugs safely because they're scared of the fact that it will enable youth to use drugs and that's never, yeah, never the case, but it's also the policies around it and stuff are just, it's all both based around treatment and focusing on treatment, which is never what we don't need to focus on. We should be thinking about the safety of youth. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it absolutely is about fear. So we're in the middle of an unprecedented overdose or drug toxicity crisis. We've lost over 2000 young people under 30. Um, we've lost many young people under 18. And understandably, there's tremendous fear about young people using drugs. And that fear is leading many, including parents and caregivers who have lost young people to a belief, again, an understandable belief that abstinence is the way to protect young people from drugs. And that that's the approach, that, that drugs are just too dangerous and that we have to, we have to encourage all young people towards abstinence. And again, let me say, we are absolutely, of course, if a young person wants to pursue abstinence, everything should be there for them to do that. But what Kali and I are, are saying, and that's why, you know, on the very first page of Kali's report on resistance, it says, youth use drugs, why deny it? The reality is, is that very young people use drugs. I, I've spoken to hundreds of young people over the past 15 years about how they started using drugs, and many talk about using injecting using meth opioids at 11, 12, 13 years old for the first time. Very young people use drugs. So what we're saying is in addition to harm reduction and treat, in addition, sorry, in addition to recovery and treatment supports, in addition to supporting young people who wanna pursue abstinence, we must make harm reduction a cornerstone of care, even for very young youth. Because as far as we can tell, we are not going to get into a situation where every young person just says no to drugs. That's not what we see on the ground every single day. I see a hand, so I could go on and on, but I see a hand, so I want to make sure that there is a hand. There's also um, some heart emojis and hand clapping. Um, Ryan Tanner, I've given you the option to unmute, I believe. Oh, sorry, try again. I think I got it. Um, go. I'm very, I have 10 million questions. So uh, hopefully I don't open too big a can of worms here. Uh, I'm very curious because I mean, uh, I work in an organization that is youth facing. We provide a lot of low barrier youth programs and are very familiar with, you know, the drug toxicity and the loss of life. So there seems to be a bit of absurdity in saying like oh if we open a youth facing ops young people are gonna die it's like no, no no that's already happening how do we stem this a bit um and working within these organizations a lot of the metrics we're working with a lot of the outputs and outcomes that funders may ask to track um for me it can often feel as though we're counting people that pass through the door, the number of people that receive a particular item, uh, and maybe less data that necessarily informs what youth needed when they showed up at our door. And I'm wondering if you have suggestions, if you have insights on ways that we can be better engaged with asking youth what they need, recording it in ways that's respectful of their privacy, their needs, the ethics, and translating that into something that tells funders more of what we actually need, like 
youth facing OPS services and stuff like that. Cause I think that's a story that is very important that I would like to be engaged in trying to tell better. And sometimes I feel a little lost in how to do that. Um, I can, nice to see you, Ryan. Um, Good to see you too. One, one big thing that we do with a lot of the youth that we work with is we do, um, we give them um, not sur like kind of like surveys, but not really, but we just, it just basically asks like, what do you need in these different categories? And it's one way we just capture um, data to see what their needs are, but also to see what we need to be doing better in ways. And it's also ways to like, really capture, like if they, like for instance, don't want to ask um, out loud if they want arm reduction supplies and stuff like that, they're able to just fill out this form and feel like here's what I need right now. And it's one way just to get um, data for stuff like that, but also to really capture the, what their actual needs are. And it's um, that's how we've been doing it um, for a while. And it's really interesting because it's um, it really captures like it's also private because it's they don't send their name to it or anything like that. Okay. Um, and it's one way that we capture what they're like, if, especially with harm reduction supplies. Like they'll be like, like, I need two mass pipes or something like that. And it's one way to capture of how to keep track of the numbers, but also keep track of who's getting um, what's going on too. Would it be okay if maybe I reached out to you after to ask about some of the tools you're using? Yeah. Okay, yeah. awesome. Thank you. I'll just add to that that, you know, I, I hear you on the metrics. It's really tricky and we talk about it a lot in, in provincial meetings about, you know, sort of where we're going with a youth substance use system of care. Um, what I what I would really emphasize and Kali, I don't know if you would agree, like, you know, even if a person walks in the door, that is such a key metric. Um, did they walk in the door? Did they have a conversation? Like those are, you know, how long did they stay? If we're thinking about relationship building, and I'm talking here about young people building relationship to a place, as well as to the people who work there, to other young people who might be there. I mean, I just think these metrics are incredibly important because I, I know many of us are seeing in the post, post COVID, I know we're not in a post COVID world, but in this moment where things have opened up, again, at least in, in downtown Vancouver, and I, you know, we're seeing dramatically different patterns of service engagement and, and access. Um, and, and we know that some, some services that were previously very busy are, are less busy. So when a young person does walk in, that's something to note. When they do have a conversation, that's something to note. Um, if they stay for a significant period, that's something to note. I, I really wish we could capture these kinds of things as well as, you know, did they pick up syringes and pipes? Did they pick up a naloxone kit? Did we refer them to, you know, a provider who can get them on o opioid agonist therapy, that kind of thing? So I think we're quite focused on, on some of those metrics as opposed to that relationship building piece that we really are hearing from almost every single young person who, who we interact with, like, I just want to build relationships. I just, I just want to have a relationship to somewhere, to people, to you know, to peers, to to providers who I trust. Um, yeah, but yeah, thank you for asking that question because it is so important. Yeah, like we keep track of like um any any time that I'm, like any, I only work with a set a specific set of youth, but a lot of the youth that we do get referred and stuff like that. A lot of times it's um. We, we do keep numbers of like how long it took to build a relationship, but also of just how how many interactions you've had with them before they actually started trusting you and stuff like that. But also just like how you built that connection too is really important metric of just like, did you share a smoke with them? Did you provide food for them? No smoking is a big no-no for a lot of funders, but it's still, it's one way to connect with youth, but it's um yeah, like, did you have a meal with them and stuff like that? It's important to keep track of those things too. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. That's um, it's hard it's hard to quantify and to to track metrics for relationships. That's that's a challenging thing to do. Absolutely. Um, we've got some more questions in the meeting chat. Um, so, when envisioning the youth overdose prevention site, were there conversations on age limits, for example, maximum age allowed in, and how do you keep that space just for youth? Thinking about how you mentioned how youth are uncomfortable and often feel unsafe in adult spaces, how do you ensure that that doesn't happen to a youth space? Well, it's actually in the report and resistance of, of some of that, those questions. Um, 
but I think the big thing is just like um, it's up to the youth, so like what they want and what they want the age limit to be and stuff like that. Um, it's up to them to create those themselves. That's why it's got to be for you by you creating those rules and those access points. Um, I think they need to be created with you. It's like we can't really give an a hard to give an answer when it's um, it needs to be used by these things. Yeah, I'd say this is a conversation that we're very actively having having with our youth advisory and and with Kali and many others. Like, how should the age issue play out in you know in a by youth for youth OPS? As Kali said, the first the first piece of this is just to work with youth to come up with a model for how this would work. But some of the things that have been suggested by youth are you know could we have specific hours for younger youth so that there are times when it's just younger youth in the space. And if, and if an older youth comes during this time, there's a plan for how to get them to another OPS, because obviously we would never want to be turning someone away, um, you know, saying, hey, you know, this is for younger youth right now, you can't use here, and then they go into an alley. Um, so having a plan for either doing EOPS with them or getting them to another site could be key. Um, but there's also discussions of how how a, a wide range of ages could could um, be together in the same space. So I think that remains to be seen, and it's probably something that would need to be, you know, worked out on the ground as something like this was was happening. It could be that one model, you know, we try one model and that doesn't work, and we need to pivot and try something else. But it it is a really interesting an important question, and it would probably be one of the most urgent questions as something like this opened up. Yeah, I could definitely see that being the case. Um, the next question I have is, what is the knowledge dissemination or mobilization among more conservative audiences, for example, beyond the converted? Has any public engagement, media tables, civics rights lawyers um, to help counter argue with the paternalistic narrative and approach surrounding youth and drugs? Um, um, I can, it's, it's gonna sound really terrible at me, but I make it really personal is when I get conservative and like I get people that don't wanna accept this. And so I, I make it like, I get really personal with them and I make it really personal about like I'll, if they um, a lot of a lot of people that are coming to these tables have kids themselves, and it's like really making them think about what if it was their own kid? Like, what if it, what if your kid like bond, was forced into treatment, came out and died? Like, if they really thought about that and actually really um, honed that and really honestly like thought about like what damaging that would I mean just how upsetting that would be, but just how when there's so much in there um, things that could have supported them to not end up dying, and so really bringing that forward is what I do a lot of times, but also bringing other people to the table too and just having like bringing youth to the table and stuff to help that message across just to hear voices but a lot of times what i'll do is um make them think about what if it's their own kid like thinking about all the options that you have to access services and stuff but also have um yeah have different options when it comes to like harm reduction and stuff like that where it could have prevented that death because these deaths are, are preventable but it's just like when these parents don't think about that a lot of times getting them to think about that it helps them narrative almost sometimes not all the time yeah i think Kali and i are both drawn into a lot of meetings you know provincially and and locally where we encounter a wide range of perspectives so i appreciate the question because i know you know potentially in in this group here you know perhaps people are coming to this talk because they feel really passionately about harm reduction for youth as well and so we, we potentially have a group of like-minded people coming together but Kali and i are also in a lot of meetings where where you know there's diverse perspectives from you know parents, caregivers, as well as providers, um, government, you know, and um, I think we just, I think everybody is deeply concerned about the just unthinkable loss of life that um, we are and continue to be confronted with many many years into this this toxic drug crisis, and so really. You know, for me, I really underscore how life saving harm reduction is. And not, again, not just in the sense of an OPS where you're observed, you know, using. And so there's that option to, to provide naloxone. That's very critical to saving lives, but it's way beyond that. When young people connect to a place, to a service, and to the people working there, that's what's life saving. When they come back again and again and again, when they come back to ask questions, when they come back when they're in crisis, 
that is what is tremendously life-saving, not just the fact that, that they can go and, and, you know, use drugs under supervision. Um, and when we approach young people with very medical and institutionalized approaches because of what so many young people have experienced across their lives in terms of government care, in terms of criminalization, in terms of um, various moments of institutionalization, when we meet young people with these very medical, very institutional approaches that are, for example, focused on treatment, focused on abstinence, focused on recovery, sometimes we can unintentionally drive them away from care. And I mean, even the most low barrier spaces. What we hear from young people a lot of the time is, I went there and they just tried to get me on Suboxone. So I never went back. Well, that place is a place where they could access harm reduction supplies. That place is a low barrier service that isn't just about treatment. So now we've got a young person disengaged from care, disengaged from a low barrier space and using, you know, alone in an alley as, as Kali is describing. So it, it, if we want to save lives, which I believe we all do, even when we're coming from very different perspectives, we have to consider what draws young people into care and what pushes them away from care. A big thing too is that when they used to deny one service, they think they're denied all services. Like it's one big thing is like when they get denied a service, it's like they'll feel like they're de um, denied mostly all services. It happens a lot. And it's such a um, heartbreaking, not heartbreaking, but more, it's a, it's a hard thing because it's just like once they get, in, like if they were denied harm supplies at one place, they won't go to another harm place to get harm supplies because they think that they will, that like the whole thing around information sharing, they think that information is shared across so they won't go to another one and they'll end up using unclean stuff and stuff like that. It's challenging. Yeah, it's very devastating when we hear over and over, for example, a 19 year old saying, I just need to do it on my own. I can't go anywhere for help and support. I've learned through what's happened to me over the past five years that I just need to take care of this on my own. I need to do it myself. And that person is so young and they've already decided that all services and systems are not for them. So, um, you know, it's, uh, we really need to be working on drawing people into care. Um, and I think everyone agrees on that. But it's just about then parsing out, well, how do we do that? And where does harm reduction fit in, in doing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, Ryan, I see your hand. I've got one last question in the meeting chat, and then I'll get back to you. Um, this is a bit of a longer question, but um, much of the moral panic seen in the media around youth substance use and specifically youth accessing diverted safer supply medications and developing an opioid use disorder seem to regard youth as a homogenous group. For example, a drug naive middle-class kid experimenting with drugs. Can this panel comment on whether this narrative impacts availability or the ability to access harm reduction or treatment options for at-risk youth who, or youth who are already using substances? Holly, do you wanna go first or should I? Sorry for laughing. It's just like the whole diversion thing makes me just giggle because it's not like it's not a really big, it's not that big like it's a at least they're accessing something that's safe. <laughs> it's my thing, but it's also just like diversion isn't happening as, as the media plays out. It's not um, like it's not really a big thing that's happening. It's such a for use, it's um it's maybe better than them accessing the street supply because the drugs are toxic right now and it's better that they're maybe accessing delays and stuff like that maybe they're a lot of times they're experimenting with them too they already use something that's um that that's why they're interested in it it's because they've already used it they've already tried it and they're already you know so it's like no use that's experimenting with drugs is gonna well we seek something like that anyways the youth that i've worked with or the youth that i know don't do that like a lot of times they've already tried it so they want to seek that out because it feels better than accessing the toxic drug supply Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, you know, the person asking the question by how it's phrased, uh, you know, shares, shares our views. Um, the diversion moral panic that's been in the media can can be very uh, damaging and tends to be very classed and, and very racialized um, in the sense that there's this panic about the, you know, middle upper class white university student who's gotten hooked on on dillies because of um 
you know, diverted hydromorphone um, from someone who had access to one of those prescriptions in, you know, downtown Vancouver. Um, there's so many problems with that narrative. I mean, one is that, again, I've, I've been talking to young people about how they started using drugs since 2007. I've talked to hundreds of young people, and I can say that the decision to go even and get diverted, you know, dillies is, is not a, it's not a light decision. And so when it comes to these middle upper class um, young people who are, who are turning to opioids, there's very urgent questions that we need to ask around, you know, why they are purchasing opioids and what's going on in their life that means that um, they're seeking out those affective intensities that come with opioid use. Uh, I don't think it's anywhere near as simple as, oh, well, they were available and I could buy them. Um, I've never heard somebody tell that kind of a story about how they started to use opioids. And then, of course, this moral panic, uh, you know, disregards the lives that are being lost among those who are who are well to an extent disregards the the lives that are being lost among those who have been very actively using opioids for a long time now and are exposed to a tremendously toxic drug supply and a, and a you know very high risk of of harm or even death each and every day um and those are are the lives you know that will be saved when we have true safe supply. Um, so the div diversion of panic can, can be very harmful when we are fighting for um, what young people who use drugs in the context of unstable housing and homelessness need, queer and trans youth, um, you know, indigenous youth, those that exist, youth in care, those that exist at these intersections, those, those narratives can be very um, damaging because we know that safe supply is needed to save lives. Mm -hmm. um, being very conscious of time, I will give you the option to unmute Ryan. Um, but if we could keep it short, that would probably be great. Oh boy, that's not my strong suit. I'll do my sorry. best. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I have a feeling, I'm gonna call it a feeling. It feels like the majority of kind of harm reduction focused programs are in Vancouver. Um, and as a result of that, it kind of feels like Vancouver isn't just responding to a Vancouver drug crisis, but the province, the country, we have people from all over accessing Vancouver for harm reduction programs. And uh, I'm wondering if in your research, you're seeing that disconnection or displacement is coming up for young people as an unintended consequence of that and how that might show up in their lives. And if you guys are seeing any path forward to developing harm reduction programs that can operate kind of smaller scale regionally, locally within communities, because I, I feel like the media is constantly just a wash of, we talked about an OPS, but the community said no. Mm. I don't know if I fully, like, I hope I'm, I'm First of all, I want to say that, you know, we we want harm reduction to be available to each and every young person across the entire province and the country. We are certainly not just arguing for this in Vancouver. So I just want to be really clear about that. There absolutely should be harm reduction programs for young people in every community, including overdose prevention. Um, and we, we are really fighting for this, not just in Vancouver, perhaps Vancouver, you know, or I should say Metro Vancouver, you know, or a, a large urban setting like Victoria, these will be among the first places to have youth OPSs, but it absolutely should not stop there. Um, and the needs for connection and for harm reduction in rural and remote and northern areas is perhaps even, you know, even greater because there are not a lot of, a lot of services and places uh, available. I think part of your question is, is part of your question like, are young people kind of coming to Vancouver because this is where they can access things? I guess I'm wondering if that is coming up. Like if you are seeing young people are like, I'm not here because I want to be here, but because this is where I'm able to access supports. Is that something that comes up? I don't know if it's a thing or not. 
don't hear that narrative a lot. People, I think, you know, young people are drawn to Vancouver for so many reasons. And um, I don't, I don't often hear, well, this is just the only place I can get housing, or this is the only place I can access harm reduction. I think it's, in my experience, at least, it's always a much more layered, complex narrative about what's sort of drawing them to the city, what's pushing them out of other places. Um, okay. Probably, I don't know if, I know we're, we're really low on time. Um, yeah. Um, one, no one's coming here for housing because we all know that's no point. Yeah, uh, one thing that I know that you um, end up coming to Vancouver a lot of times for is when they were accident treatment and they got sent out of their community and they end up in Vancouver is one big issue that we're, we face a lot of is that you end up leaving, like going getting sent from the island, getting sent all the way to Kelowna for some treatment center and stuff. So they end up coming to Vancouver because it's the last resort for them or a lot of place where they can feel like they can run to. So yeah, sad, but it's yeah, a lot of youth that are access and treatment and try to get out of, and then end up leaving that treatment and end up displaced a lot of times is what we're seeing is what I see I mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I also have a comment here from another participant. Um, we see that on Vancouver Island, the youth travel to Victoria because there's more services in the South Island as opposed to the central or north portion of the island. That's a big thing because yeah, the North Island is really, 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 um, same with the Central Island is really lacking when it comes to services for you and stuff it's yeah 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 i was just kind of curious if there's hidden things of like youth losing access to supports in home community as a consequence of these other systems at all i guess that's a different way to phrase the question yeah i mean i'll just say that supports in communities across the province are so important like we often hear about prevention as well when it comes to youth well the way that I think about prevention is like strengthening communities across the province. What is available for young people? What opportunities, education, work, leisure, spiritual, cultural, like strengthening what is available for young people in communities across the province? That is that is absolutely a piece of a piece of prevention because when when young people don't have access to many or any opportunities in, in home communities, um, that is when they look, they look elsewhere and sometimes look to, to drugs as, as a, you know, a way to achieve some of those affective intensities, like a sense of momentum or excitement that, that others of us, you know, get through our work or through school or through, you know, socializing at a community center, all of these different things. So, Strengthening communities is, is critical, absolutely critical. And then of course, for those young people who do use drugs in communities, we need harm reduction, programming and spaces everywhere. It's a big ask, but it is what we need. Um, not just in Vancouver, not just in Victoria, not just in Kelowna, we need, we need um, much more available to young people across the province and the country. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump in here and just note that both Dania and um, Kali have put their emails in the meeting chat. Um, if anybody wants to meet, reach out to them directly. Um, I also note here, Dania, you said you've got some questions in your chat that you weren't able to answer. So what I'm going to do, do you, um, Dania and Kali, do you both have time to stick around a little longer or where are we sitting? I mean, I, I can. I, I know Kali's working <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> well, I'm going to sit for another like five, five minutes. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so maybe before Daniel, before you jump into any of those questions you might have, if I just want to thank people for joining that have joined. And obviously, if you need to step away, we understand completely. But we do still have a number of people who are still on the call. Um, and I'm I'm presuming by that that they're still interested in hearing more. So maybe let's um let's let that happen. I think, you know, I sorry, I didn't even have time to look through. I just I got a number of direct messages. I think we have okay. presented on most of them. I just want to highlight, um, Amanda, I know you were going to distribute page one of the harm reduction calls to action two pager. I'm thinking maybe we should share the two pager. <laughs> I think you're right. I see that, you know, there is interest in that document. And thank you so much for the interest. Um, we absolutely want to get that to everyone. Um, I also, I, I wanted to just say a number of people commented on the beautiful uh, visuals in the slides. 
Um, those were done by various artists, but one of the companies that uh, I have used regularly is Drawing Change. Um, great company. Uh, we had a couple of artists work on, on the illustrations that you saw. I'm happy to provide more detail by email. And then that final OPS image was done by a student of mine and, and a member of the youth health team at the BCCSU, Sophie McKenzie. Um, so thank you so much to Sophie again for, for creating that incredible youth OPS image for us. Um, we've provided our emails. Any final comments or questions? So appreciate everyone staying for so long. It, it really means a lot. I don't have anything else uh, coming through for questions on my end, but I do um, sincerely want to thank both, um, both you, Dania and Callie for joining today um, and for sharing your expertise and your, your, your knowledge in this area. Um, it's been an incredible talk and I found it very, very insightful. I'm sure many of our attendees have as well. Um, and thank you again to all the attendees for joining today. Um, I'll be sending out an email later on today or early tomorrow with um, a very quick survey for some feedback and um, with links to the video from today, as well as some supporting materials. Um, so thank you all so much for joining. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you yeah, so thank much. You. Bye.